Second. Motion to open. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, tonight, for something a little bit different, I'd like to invite John Jarvis to lead us in saluting the flag. And as you people stay around later, you'll know why. <laughs> Step up, John. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, my, we got any board or committee? I just, quick, um, I just wanted to remind the board of selectmen that next Wednesday, the 18th, we have the joint uh, public hearing for the site plan review and uh, water supply public hearing for the 6769 Newburyport Turnpike Project, and that's scheduled for 7:15. Um, so I think here. Kathy's yeah here, yep, and the. Uh, packets have been distributed to you. I'm expecting a letter from our review engineer by the end of the week, which I will also forward on to you, to you all. So, just a reminder, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, that's a Tuesday. Wednesday. 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 Thank you. All right. Um, citizens' concerns, we have none listed on here. Um, we have a public hearing at 7.30 on the dog hearing. Um, we have... Um, town administrator's report, I guess we have time for that. Sure. Um, first, I'd ask that the board consider the appointment of Eric Savan to the Public Safety Complex Committee. He'll be our uh, community representative, and um, he's an architect serving for Gund Partnership. Uh, motion to approve. Second. Okay. Any questions? No? All in favor? Aye. And um, I'd like to submit for your review a use of facilities form, um, maybe for approval next at the next selectmen's meeting. I've noticed over the course of the last year or so different groups coming in for renting various fields or buildings. And sometimes you have the information you need. A lot of times we have to gather it from various department heads. So I thought if we could implement a form like this or similar to that, it would come to the board with everything you need at okay. once. So I'll, I'll email that out to you and on your new um, iPads and you can take a look at that. All right. Just go Kathy. Yes, yes. You also had, um, back on August 9th, the media committee forms to review, but with David not here, I don't know if you want to wait until the next meeting so he can go through that with you. Well, do we have to table it or anything? Or just yeah. Make a motion to table it? Yeah. I make a motion we table that till the next meeting. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay. The other thing we tabled from the last meeting was um, consideration for entering into veterans, a veteran service district or into an intermunicipal agreement with Newburyport with the intention of perhaps forming a district in the future, assuming that it would go through the legislature. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to review the documentation. Yeah. Um, Kevin, I got a couple questions. Yes, please. The proposed district that you're talking about, what does that include? Some people have called me with some questions on it. When you say what, what well, the, the, you mean the you, number you, of towns? As it, as it works now, you work for Newburyport, and how's it going to work? Yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to form what's called an intermunicipal um, agreement between five communities, and those five communities are Newbury, Merrimack, Newburyport, Amesbury, and Salisbury. Last night, Newburyport voted to approve it. Previously, Merrimack has voted. Tonight, Amesbury is doing their first reading on it. The second reading will be in October, and they're expected to go along with it because they were kind of in the for forefront of it. And then uh, we also believe that uh, Salisbury is going to vote to approve tonight. So it looks very positive if you guys come along that we will have five towns in the district. I will be working for 
the city of Newburyport, but uh, the money that I spend, if you will, is apportioned from all of the four or five towns that are involved. And it is not a formal state district, which is something that we may move to, but we've been told by uh, Koppelman Page, the lawyers, that we can use this IMA for 25 years. So what we're putting in place is something that is as solid as a rock. And, it, and let me add to it, it doesn't change the veteran services for anyone in Newbury, it enhances them. Why know. isn't it a state? I don't understand. Are the, most of them state? The state, if we went with a state uh, district, we would run into some conflict with a law where it sta says the two cities cannot be adjacent to each other. And Newburyport and Amesbury are two cities. And we felt that trying to get a home rule petition, which is one of the things we will request, a home rule petition, would take a lot longer than just establishing an intermunicipal agreement. And uh, the home rule petition will still be sought, but it really uh, runs parallel with whatever would happen with the state because we're, you're basically in total control of the thing. The difference between the two, with the state-guided district, there would be a board formed, and I would not work for Newburyport. I would work for the board. And you would be one of five votes on the board. But as of right now, you'd be working for new report and not a board. That's correct. All right. That's okay. any comments, any questions about it? You know what? That's complicated. I mean, I'm having trouble. And maybe the other folks are smarter than I am, but in other words, like MGL mass general law doesn't allow you to farm the reason, let me explain why they set the two city regulation up. The group of people who form what could be called a union like me, the veteran agents across the state, asked the legislature to create a set of laws that prohibited cities from joining because they saw themselves being put out of business. If two cities such as Danvers, Beverly, and Salem came together, you've got one person then where three are now in place. and. So the laws were set up so that cities couldn't do it. Well, it actually penalized the smaller cities like uh, Newburyport and Amesbury, the third and fourth smallest cities in the state. And it prevented them from forming what the town of Framingham with a population of 60,000 could do, and they'll be bigger than all five of these towns and cities together. So that's the reasoning behind the law, why it came into an existence, and why we kind of have to step around it. It in no way uh, affects the veterans in Newbury. It, it really benefits them, because what's going to happen now is the veterans in Newbury are going to be able to get a phone answered whenever they call. Right now, I'm, on, I'm by myself, and I'm also part-time to Newbury. It means there'll be a full-time person answering the phone, and I'm also going to be able, uh, once all of this gets completed, if it does, be able to hire an admin assistant to do a lot of the rote uh, computer work, which will give me more outreach. So, Can I ask you yeah. a, a question, because it's probably because of, of non-knowledge. As of now, before this consortium or, or whatever it will be called, the, the association of the, town, the two cities and the towns, where were you getting your money from? I was an independent uh, working for Newberry. I had a part-time relationship with Newberry. Newberry paid me a stipend. Now, with this new stand, with, you know, with this new way of going about it, will it become much more expensive for us than it used to be? It will become more expensive than it used to be. I would not agree that it would become much more expensive than it used to be for the simple reason that you were not paying for services that you were getting for free, and you're now paying for them. Now, the alternative to this is we have our own and continually we're going, or what? We Actually, we find ourselves in somewhat of an enviable position because we've also been offered to join the Eastern Mass um, Veterans District, um, which is Raleigh, West Newbury, Ipswich, Georgetown, I think is the seven other one. Seven towns. Yeah, there's seven it's headquartered towns. headquartered in Ipswich. 
that so they don't have any two cities that throw no them they're in. already established um but we would have to ask to go into that group and they'd have to take a vote to allow us to go in so either uh, that or the Newburyport intermunicipal agreement would cost just about the same amount of money entering into that if we chose to um hire a full-time agent just to represent ourselves i think those costs would be somewhat cost prohibitive i, d I don't think that would make a lot of sense but well, the two options are the, the towns or the join the towns of the city yeah I, I would consider those two yeah Chuck, i'll tell you what thoughts Go ahead, you first. Yeah, go ahead. Why don't we hear from the other consortium, see what they have to say, and make a decision. Do we have to make a decision tonight for this gentleman? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could close the, we could we could close those back doors too and that'll help. Uh, Chuck, say it a little louder for the folks out back. See, we have not heard from the other consortium. Yeah. So we should entertain that listen to them, then make a decision. Well, I think what Chuck's saying is that we've only got one side of it. I'll tell you what, this gentleman has been great through the whole process that he's been involved with us. He's been outstanding. So this isn't going to be any easy decisions if the decision should require not going with you. Um, I think we need a little time. We're on a full board, so I'll make a motion that do you need a decision tonight? I don't need a decision tonight. I would like to have decision tonight, and the, the reason I, well, let me explain why. Yeah. Everyone else is moving in that direction right now, and as long as we don't have five cities or towns, we can't then go out and hire an admin and take the load off me, and I've been pretty much carrying the load by myself for six months. I would like, uh, from a selfish position, uh, be able to hire that admin. I also have a bias. I mean, I'm a 40-year resident of Newbury, and uh, I don't want to see veterans in Newbury going all the way to Ipswich for their services. And I think it's, it's, it's ludicrous. Let them come to Newburyport. I think we need to hear from the other group because I don't know that they'd have to go to Ipswich. Can that. you invite them to come I, to that I'd be meeting? happy to do that, but, but, but I do agree with Kevin. You know, there is a little bit of a time crunch here maybe um, because they can't put out their assessments until they know whether or not Newbury is in or out. So. I'll tell you, I, I wouldn't mind trying to gather some information, put out the ability to uh, be on, and put out the ability for them to come talk to us maybe, and if we have to have some sort of you know, special meeting or whatever, we'll get together. When's that next elections meeting? Two weeks. 20. Is it quicker than two weeks that you need an answer? It, it's your choice. Um, all right. So what, well, you feel, no, you appreciate your way. position, appreciate all the work you've done, but we really need to investigate this completely before we make a decision. Okay. So please understand our position mm -hmm. too. So. All, right, all right. So you'll yeah. invite them to our next meeting? Uh, sure. Representative from yep. Ipswich or wherever? Okay. Thank, Thank you, Kevin. You. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Um, I received two disclosure forms that I wanted to enter into the record from uh, Daniel Jenkins who is a newly appointed reserve police officer and his brother Stephen Jenkins who serves as a sergeant on the Newbury Port uh, I'm sorry the Newbury Police Department oops um, just notifying the board that they are indeed brothers and that they may from time to time have an appearance of a conflict of interest so those are just for the record okay um, I wanted to notify the board of uh, our Building Commissioner Sam Joslin has been recently appointed to the Board of Directors of the Massachusetts Federation of Building Officials. You may have seen there was some coverage in the local paper. Um, they basically are, are charged with increasing public awareness of the uh, role that the building officials play in public safety um, and advocate for reasonable codes and regulations. So um, very pleased that he was appointed to that group and expect to uh, be on the cutting edge of everything that's happening in the state relative to code enforcement. 
Michelle Brantaforti, who is our newly appointed uh, principal assessor, has also received uh, her Massachusetts accredited assessor's designation. And that's, uh, that designation is earned after about two years worth of coursework. Um, so we're very pleased with that. Also wanted to acknowledge uh, Frank Bertolino. He assisted me. We're working with the Byfield Community Arts Center in putting a lease agreement in place. And he was kind enough to offer us comparative market analysis uh, work which he performed at no cost to the town. So I just wanted the board to be aware of that. And finally, more good news. I received our free cash certification from the Department of Revenue, so we'll have the money available for expenditure at the fall town meeting. Our free cash was certified at $848,263. Um, Basically, that was a culmination of a, a number of things, including revenues, which were about $135,000 higher than we had anticipate, anticipated, primarily um, motor vehicle excise. We closed out a little over $270,000 in um, unexpended appropriation balances. The biggest issues um, were relative to changes made at the transfer station. Board of Health closed out almost $80,000 in their accounts, um, in their expense account, because they didn't have to pay for those costs. We had a couple of positions that were not filled for the entire year, so there was about $40,000 there. We realized about another $45,000, $47,000 in um, unexpended um, unemployment costs. We didn't have any layoffs this year, so that was, that was good news, as well as in the um, health insurance, we're still uh, getting the benefit of some of those planned design changes. So that was, you know, that was the majority of what made up the free cash, along with there was about a little over 400000 that remained unexpended last year. So, and just to give you an idea of, of some of, you know, what we've done, what have, what have we done with our free cash over the last couple of years? We have purchased police cruisers, two dump trucks. We've covered our snow and ice deficits, which exceeded $100,000. We didn't have to carry them forward until, you know, into the next year. We uh, are replacing the middle weir, um, or creating a, okay. a middle road weir. We um, have funded some historic committee expenses, purchased firefighter gear, spent over $50,000 on repairs to the elementary schools. We've repaired the library, um, completed the work at the DPW garage. Um, what else? Well, that's, that's the majority of it. Um, a lot of administrative tasks, firearms licensing, town code books, updating. Um, significant amount of building improvements but uh, we've, we've been able to do quite a bit in the last two years done well. so I think it's a compliment well. to how our department heads have run they've been very very tight and not spent any extra money and, and we had that money left over and it's a compliment to them free cash is definitely um, an indicator of the financial well-being of your community This shows me that we are now you know we we received a mandate from the voters they weren't willing to support the override so what we've done is we've lived within the operating budget constraints um, and we've maximized our revenues so it, it's all good news they've done a great job yeah. but Tracy don't we if you forecast a vision forward look like things could become very expensive in the next few years again we've we've got some things we need to be aware of we've been um, notified by the school administration we know we're going to expect a pretty significant increase in our assessment but we do have some building going on um, so hopefully that'll mitigate the impact of that um, I you know I think it's I think it's good news yep. that's it. thank okay, you that's it Mr. Chairman, before you move on, should we fire off a letter of thanks to Frank Bertolino for his work? I already did it. Oh, yep. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Done. <laughs> All right. Is that it for you? Yep. All right. Um, we still have 10 minutes. Reconfirm Neil Harrington as our representative for the three towns with the Triton School Committee in contract negotiations. We have a letter here. Um, <clears throat> someplace. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, dear sir, we have begun the planning process for contract negotiations with the Triton Regional Teachers and Instructional Assistance Associations. The Triton Regional School Committee will be opening negotiations this fall with these bargaining units for their contracts set to expire on August 31st, 2014. Pursuant to Chapter 140E, Section 1 of Mass General Laws, <clears throat> in the case of a regional school district, said chief executive officers or chairman of boards of selectmen, as the case may be, of the member cities and towns shall, in accordance with the regulations to be promulgate, promulgated by the Board of Education, elect one of their members to represent them pursuant to the requirements of this section. In previous negotiations, the towns of Newbury, Raleigh, and Salisbury have collectively, vo collectively voted to approve Neil Harrington, town manager for Salisbury, as a representative of the three towns. Neil has again expressed his interest in representing the Triton committees in this negotiation process. I respectfully request that you forward to me your approval to reconfirm Neil Harrington as the representative for your town or be work collectively together to nominate and approve a new representative. As we are looking to begin formal negotiations by early October to ensure concrete data for the budgeting process, I ask that you submit your response no later than Friday, September 20th. Please do not hesitate to contact me should you have any questions. Thank you. Deb Schott, um, uh, Chair of the Triton Regional School Committee, and Dina Sullivan, Chair of the Personnel and Negotiations Subcommittee. Um, motion? Yeah, motion. Okay. Second? Second. Okay. No. Discussion. You got yes. some questions? I do. How long is this appointment good for? Is it yearly or three years? No, no. It's to negotiate this this contract. Just the contract. They're just these contracts. Six years. And some history on it. Yeah. Um, they need continuity. They need the person to make a commitment to be at all the meetings and be there for the vote. Okay. Um, a few years ago, Neil had something coming up, and Chuck Costro was the negotiator for that particular contract, uh, that contract period. And Chuck represented the three towns for, for that one, and now um, they've recommended Neil. Neil's done it once before. Chuck? No, I mean, where Neil's been there before, and um, I trust his judgment on this, I think it's an appropriate uh, motion. That we made. All right. All right. All right. I'll go. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So we'll uh, All right. send a letter. Do, do we have to send them a letter? They have a letter right after that Salisbury used, so it's probably much the same. Yeah, send them a letter. Okay. Uh, Kathy, can you draft one? Um, Thanks, Kathy. Five minutes. We have a one day request for a one day liquor license. Uh, for New England Spencer Pierce Little Farm uh, for September 28th and 29th, and they have in their Harvest Festival, I believe they call it that that one. What? Uh, yeah, it's the Harvest Festival September, and it'll be from 12 to 6 p.m. on those days. Is done this before, Kat? Yes. Okay. Motion to accept. Second. Any discussion? No. All in favor? Fine. Good. All right. All right. Dawn, six minutes? All right. Uh, step up to the microphone, and I'll introduce you. This is, ladies and gentlemen, this is Dawn Jarvis. Um, he's a, the reason I jumped on him to lead the salute of the flag is he's a veteran of uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. And his job over there was um, demolition and blowing up the IEDs that they had set to ambush our soldiers. And he's got a project that he wants to speak for. So I'm a, I'm a vet. I have PTSD and a bunch of other issues. My biggest thing is I want to raise awareness of PTSD amongst the veterans in the community, as well as providing them services for friends, families, and neighbors as far as education goes, and helping the vets with the PTSD. Um, right now, I'm starting to get a service dog to help me 
um, through Operation Delt the Dog. Uh, this charity rescues dogs from shelters and trains them to be vets, uh, train them to be service dog for veterans. Um, each dog is about eight grand to train, heal, and all that stuff. Um, I want to raise awareness for the charity so it can help out veterans in our community and as well as hopefully get programs together um, to help the vets in our community and the friends and families. Uh, there's a lot of vets that I know that are dealing with issues with PTSD that have fallen to the wayside and are struggling, and I'd rather snip it in the butt before it gets too late. So I'm hoping the town of Newbury can back me up on this and help bring awareness and support to the veterans. Okay. Um, so some follow-up on it. Our cable uh, t access television is going to do an interview with Dawn so it can spread the word around, and we're going to try and share that with other towns. And, um, again, I think, uh, you know, thank God we have people like him. He grew up in Newbury. He attended, graduated from Triton. And I think we should give him a round of applause. <laughs> Enough. He doesn't want too much. <laughs> thank you. Okay. And Don, when, when might you get the dog? Soon. Um, it can be as far as from Thursday till Saturday this weekend. Uh, training already started. I've met the dog, hung up the dog with three times now. I had training last night for two and a half hours down at the MSPCA in Methuen. Yep. They've let us use the facility. Uh, the trainer that trains for the charity has over 30 years of experience training service dogs. And she's doing all the training at a cheap price to help the charity out, to help veterans out. Um, so I think it's a great charity. I mean, the dogs get rescued, the vets get the help they need. Um, I'm looking forward to it, and I want to share this experience with other veterans, but it obviously it costs money. So I'm trying to do fundraisers to raise, you know, the 8000 per dog. Um, done a lot of community events here with the Newbury, Newbury Port. I'm attached to one in Ainsbury. We're doing some at the Topsfield Fair this year Good. just to get the word out there and try to educate people, you know, get them on board and understand a little bit on what the vets are going through. Um, and hopefully, like, help and support for the vets. Family is the hardest part because family, unless you've been f deployed or been through, like, a traumatic experience, you, you don't really understand a lot of what the PTSD means to a veteran. And I'm sure a lot of folks in this room, if I was to ask them what PTSD means to them, they wouldn't really have a clear understanding on what it is for the veterans. So I, I want to change that. You know, maybe we can get the community to support the vets a little more. I, we, I've gotten tremendous amount of support when I was deployed, both deployments. Um, you know, you come home, the city welcomes you home, it's all great. A few months later, you're by yourself. And you know what? The vets need more support when they're home than when they're de deployed. I mean, the de deployment support is huge. It's great. It's awesome. Can we have that same support when we come back home, when we need the help? I would hope the answer yes. Um, so my goal is to to raise awareness and try to get programs established. Um, I've talked to a few guys about what they feel would be great. Um, right now, the Lowell Vet Center is probably a great example on how, you know, on some of the groups they offer. Well, that's in Lowell. Some vets can't drive. I couldn't drive until midsummer this year. So I couldn't go to Lowell for that kind of help. Why could not we develop something like that in this community? And just, you know, set, set an example offer the services to new report rallies the surrounding communities, and then, you know, show the state that we can do this, we can help the vets out, and maybe it can be like a, tr a trend down the road. Well, I don't know. You're, you're a great spokesman, and especially when you get the dog uh, and it's on TV and you go to the fairs and things, it would be terrific to really see the interaction of the dog and how the dog helps in the whole five years. Yeah, I've already, I've already told the owner of the charity that I am willing to be the spokesperson with the dog, stand up and say, hey, I'm a vet, I need your help, but not only me, but all the other vets who are, who haven't come forward and say, hey, I need help, or have a little hard time with admitting they need help. That's the first part of it, is admitting you need help. You know, and a lot of family can see, when I came back to my rack, I had a huge problem. Um, and no one knew what was going on, they just thought, oh, you're just partying. Well, it's one of the signs that, hey, if something's wrong, he's coping a different way. I mean, if a family were more educated and friends were more educated, maybe it wouldn't have gotten as bad as it did. So I want to kind of nip it in the butt and 
provide services and education to friend and family, you know, and well, the vets. Um, one of my things is I want to set up like gr little groups kind of like this, but kind of like the way other meetings work, where like AA for prime example, have the vets confidential group, they all come in, they talk about something, you know, they share their thoughts and their experiences and what they're dealing with, and it's kind of like therapeutic, you know, um, you don't have that around you. I don't, I, I've never heard of or seen a group being advertised, hey, attention vets, you know, PTSD meeting group, Newbury Town Hall tonight, 8 o'clock. That, that might be a good starting point for the vets. You know, it's free, no expense, really, really yeah. you know, I don't know. Great, great. Sure. Yes. Could you step up to the microphone? Otherwise, well, they can't hear you if you don't. <laughs> it's all yours. And identify yourself and step up. No, I just wanted to make a comment that these are service dogs. Correct. Yeah. True service dogs, and that they have to be treated as so when they go into stores, That's and hospitals, yes. and everything. That's a major because a lot of people feel that why should somebody like him have a dog? That they don't understand the PTSD. That's yep. exactly what I'm coming from. And it's from. very, very important because yep. there have been incidences. I don't know if you've had it. Yeah, made the news yep, that diner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the diner. Yeah. 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 Y
Okay, well, anyone that was on it, do they want to add anything to it? Carol. Um, they did put here that the animal control officer did not quarantine the dog. We did quarantine the dog, but the quarantine is only for 10 days for a bite. And after that, the dog is off of quarantine. And I did uh, go to any complaint that Sue or anybody, it's mostly Sue that I got complaint calls from. I'm not aware of these other people, but when they called me, that they were, there was a dog barking. I did go out on the calls. There might have been two or three. I might have been in another town on another call, but I did attend to the call. Okay. Yeah. Did you did find the barking to be a nuisance? I would say out of 12 times, uh, twice I found the dog barking. And I did not just drive by. I would go on the other street behind the house and sit in the cruiser there. And I would just wait there for about 15 minutes to see if I heard it. Or I'd go in another area before I even went by the house. I went, uh, you know, I would sit down. So on Morgan Ave to see right. if I heard him. Now, your opinion, you know, it's, it's your opinion. I can only give you what, what your, your I, observations what were. What my observations were, unfortunately. Yep. And I know that on one of the calls there was a uh, officer leaving. He heard the call come in and he said, I'll call the animal control officer and tell her. He immediately left here and went there. When I got there, he was parked down the street. And he said, Carol, I didn't hear anything. And I left right from the station. I can only do so much. I can only go when I'm called, do my job. But if I don't hear it, I don't hear it. Yep. I'm not living there. Yep. So I, don't, I can only tell you what I see. OK. Or hear. All right. Now, um, Joe, before you. I mean, before we hear from other people, we have other information here too, and you folks might not know that we have other information. Shouldn't you maybe read some of the other letters? Well, I was going to go through this one. Yeah, right, whatever. Good. But yeah, if there's just anything so else, you know what other information that. we have, what we're working yeah, with. There's several letters similar to this. Um, here's one from Lynn Walker on Beacon Avenue, Newburyport. I was quite surprised and frankly shocked at the news that Linda Hanscom's dog, Titus, is being accused of a vicious animal. I just want to share my experience with Titus. I encountered Titus numerous times while walking in the neighborhood or just being in my own yard. Many times my two and a half year old granddaughter is with me. Titus allows my granddaughter to pet and hug him many times without ever an incident. Titus is always gentle. This interaction is always preceded by an exuberant tail wagging from Titus and a laugh of exhilaration for my granddaughter. I hope your decision will allow my granddaughter and me the pleasure of continuing, continuing our relationship with Titus. Is Lynn Walker here? No, all right. Um, here's another one. I'm writing to, in regard to the complaint letter recently sent to you about Linda Hanscom and her dog, Titus, who resides at 18 South Pond Street. I've come to know Linda over the past few years as a fellow dog owner who cares greatly about her dog. I read the July 1st letter sent to you by some of Linda's neighbors and was quite frankly dumbfounded by the claims made in this letter. I would like to start by saying that Linda is an exceptionally responsible pet owner. I have never once seen Titus off his leash, nor have I ever witnessed a time when Titus was barking at a car or other passerby, as most dogs do. When Linda did not come out to stop him, oh, when Linda yep. did not come out to stop him from barking. In fact, virtually every time I walk by Linda's house, Linda's in the yard when Titus is out in the yard, specifically to ensure that Titus does not bark. Linda also places Titus in doggy daycare several times during a week, so he is not even there at home during the day. The July 1st letter states that Titus molests neighbors, motor vehicles, pedestrians, and persons on bicycles. I ask, how could he possibly do all this when he's never out of his yard without a leash and by Linda's side when he's home? <laughs> okay, we have, to, we have to get through this. <laughs> I'm not directly aware of the specific claim where Titus was in a dog fight with another dog. However, other dog walkers in the area have relayed that Titus was on his leash when he was approached by this other dog that lives in Newburyport where there is a leash law in effect and the dog was off leash. 
Yes, Titus is big and maybe scary to some people because of his size, but he's a good dog who's loved and is well cared for. Linda is a single woman who deserves to have the protection of a good dog. And this was sent by Susan Murphy on Withington Street. But it was also signed by one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. seven other people. Yeah. Next page. And we have another letter just the same, right? Before it. Before it, yeah. Um, okay, well, these, these are the signatures for the same one, I think, aren't they? No? no? Oh, that was for the letter in it. Yeah. Okay, other letter. Jeff's correct. And I mean, you don't have to read it, but this is signed. It says basically, unless you want to read it, Joe, you want to read it? Well, I think so. Okay. We might as well get them all done. The gone. undersigned residents of South Pond Street and adjoining streets submit this letter in support of Linda Hanscom's, Hanscom and her dog, Titus. We respectfully acknowledge the legitimate concerns of our neighbors who submitted the petition dated July 1st, 2013, concerning Linda and Titus. However, we feel that Linda has worked very hard to address these concerns by taking a number of steps, including the following. Keeping Titus inside the house more, particularly in the morning and evening hours. Accompanying Titus frequently when he is outside and disciplining him when he barks. Sending Titus to doggy daycare five days a week from approximately eight to four during most weeks. Investing in a costly citronella bark deterrent collar padlocking in the fenced area where Titus is confined, using a muzzle and a short lease, three feet, when walking Titus in the neighborhood. As a result of Linda's efforts, Titus's barking has decreased significantly and is now roughly at average dog levels. I don't know what that is, but. <laughs> These measures also address the safety concerns raised by the petition, by the Many of uh, the undersigned have properties directly adjacent to or across the street from Linda and Titus, and many of us have young children. We can attest that we and our children do not live in fear of Titus or consider him vicious. We, some of us prefer that Linda had a different dog or no dog at all, sure. But as part of a community, we know that sometimes we have to compromise with one another. We know that Linda has made great efforts to address the concerns of her neighbors. And finally, we know that Titus is a beloved member of Linda's family, and separating them would be disproportionate and unnecessary. For these reasons, we ask the Board of Selectmen to dismiss the petition. And I'll try and read some of the letters, but some of the names. Lara Matak, Christian Riley, Angel... Is that Angel or what? Anyway, twi uh, what I do is give the addresses. How's that? I can read those. 25 Withington Street and another person from 25 Withington Street. Um, someone from 27 Withington Street. Nine. I don't know. I can read that street. What is there a street up there? Begin with a G. G-U-L. Gill. Nine Gill Street. Okay. Um, 19 South Pond Street. 16 South Pond Street. 17 South Pond Street. 20 South Pond Street, and maybe 20 or 21 South Pond Street. Anyway, there's been several letters. We've got these letters in front of us. Um, there was an incident, another incident that's not related here, and a report came in that Titus had escaped and tried to get into the house, next, uh, two houses up from Linda's house. And as a result of that complaint, I met with, Carol LaRock, and at that point, because of the information we had, we deemed, we classified Titus as a dangerous dog, okay? Um, ba again, based on the reports. Two days after that, I went up, and I, I went up with Chief Riley, and we knocked on the door. Titus was inside the house with Linda. We walked in the house, and I had gotten all kinds of advice from people, and some dogs are very territorial, some are protective, some are just vicious, okay? As I approached the house, the first thing I noticed was the yard does have a chain link fence around it. Um, and in the yard, living where Titus runs around is a couple dozen chickens, okay? Um, that kind of surprised me. Went in the house, and Titus, He's a good old guy, I'll tell you. You know, all he wanted to do was lick me. And he kept, and he, he's a big dog. He kept wanting to rub his head on my leg and thigh, and he did that. And uh, 
he never once was defensive or aggressive. And I was, I was there dressed like this, I guess. And Chief Riley was me with uniform. You always hear about dogs not liking uniforms, okay? I mean, he sat down, he was obedient, and that was our visit with Titus that day. We looked at the thing where, in the, in the complaint where, the, where Titus had gotten out that day was the gate wasn't adequate and the Titus broke through the gate. Well, as it turned out, there was some tree work being done in Linda's yard. And the guy doing the tree work left the gate open. So that's why Titus was out. He didn't bust out, okay? Linda was concerned enough, so she bought a new lock and a new thing to secure the gate better before she had a bungee strap on it. I guess that had worked for a while, whatever. But that was, again, my observation that day. And the other thing I did is after that, I rode up and down the road, slow, fast in my car. And um, sometimes Titus would run along the fence. And he never barked at me. He kind of woofed, like a low woof, OK? I, I, again, I don't know what that means, but that's how I describe it, OK? And um, the other thing is I read once that dogs that are really aggressive, and they'll dig under a fence. Well, Titus has lived there. Is it four years, r roughly? Uh, three years. Three years. Okay, and so there's no, he's not trying to dig out or escape from the fence. You can see where he runs back and forth. So that's my observation from there. Um, uh, Chief, did you have any observations? I know you went up there several times. We have, since 2011, the Police Department's received approximately a dozen complaints for barking dogs. Our standard protocol with a barking dog complaint is not drive directly to the house. Um, our crews is drive to the neighborhood, park someplace out of eyesight of the house, and listen. None of my officers have reported hearing the dog barking. Um, that doesn't mean he, he doesn't bark. And I don't live in the neighborhood, so I don't know what the people that live there see every day. All I can report is what our officers have seen and what I've seen personally. Um, after meeting Titus, I've met with him a couple of more times. Um, I find him to be a friendly dog. I find him to be a, a hyper, but he, he, he's enthusiastic. Um, but I, I, I like him. I don't know what else to say. I like the dog. But what, what happens is now, I think Titus knows my car. Because when, initially, when I initially got the petition, I went down, and Titus, I had never met Titus, and Titus, was, would run at the fence and, and bark, and it's more of a low bark, but it's a bark, and he's a big dog. And for somebody that doesn't know that dog, he looks aggressive, he looks mean, but he's not. I, 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 I don't know what else to say, and this is just my observation, and, and the neighbors that live around Titus that see him every day might have a different observation. Um, I think now he knows my car, so when he sees my car drive by like I did this afternoon, he runs the fence and he, he barks, but my observations have been once my car is out of eye uh, sight from the fence, the barking stops. It doesn't continue. Um, that's been the observation of my police officers, too. When they do go to the house and the dog is barking, once they leave and they're out of eye, eye shot of the dog, the barking subsides. So I don't know what else to say. It's, it's difficult because we get these complaints. They usually come in between 10 in the morning, and the latest one we've had, I think, is at 8 o'clock at night. Uh, there's been a dozen of them. And, you know, as far as the normal barking dog complaints that the police department get, we usually get them at the late hours of the night, 10 at night to 2, 3 in the morning, and when people can't sleep. But I don't know the circumstances of the neighbors. So if it's disturbing their quiet enjoyment, that's, that's another issue. But yeah. from our observations, when we get there, we're not seeing the, the barking and the aggressive behavior. My, my officers all like the dog. So. Yeah. Can um, Go ahead, no, I, want to I, I did, I was thinking about it, and the thing you always hear stories about the most expert people dealing with dogs are mailmen, <laughs> okay? And so Mike did talk to the mailman in the neighborhood. Two, two postal carriers. Two postal carriers, okay. Um, and they both said they will bark, um, but they've never had an issue with him. He's always confined, and um, once they're out of, out of the area, you know, out of eye shot of the house, he is fine. So. Yeah. That was that. Um, there was something else I was going to say, and it slipped my mind. So I'm sorry. I interrupted that's you. okay. 
hold, hold on, hold the thought then for one sec, Chief, and I'll, I gotta give you a snapshot in time what it is to be a selectman when we have a public hearing like this. Uh, for me, I have always been a dog guy. In fact, my son has the dog that we waterfowl with now because I don't know if you remember on the TV, but my dog was killed by coyotes about 10 years ago. So, but it, sitting up here as a selectman, I kind of want you to know what we're going through. When we have a public hearing such as this, and it's under General Laws Chapter 40, Section 157, Hepburn, Maine, concerning dog licenses owned or harbored by you, you are hereby notified on Tuesday, September 10th, 2013, the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Newbury will hold a public hearing at the Town Hall 25 High Road, Newbury, Mass. at 7.30 to determine whether or not an order should be entered into concerning the restraint or disposal of such dog as the Board may deem necessary. So I just want you to know what it is like to be in the seat up here. Okay. Uh, One of the things, what my, my final observation, and then if you have any questions, I'll gladly answer them, but um, I've worked with Ms. Hanscom. She has been very accommodating as far as trying to find ways to remediate the barking. Um, one of the things that I did notice is he, he's prompted a lot by line of sight. So if somebody he knows is walking by or a car is walking by, he gets excited and runs and barks. It's a chain link fence, and I think a lot could be done if we cut that line of sight in the front and maybe just put slats in there to see what that is. And Ms. Hanscom and I have talked about that, and she's more than willing to try different things. She's trying to be a good neighbor, but you know, obviously this is very difficult for her as it is for all of the rest of her neighbors. Yep, okay. All right, uh, yes. Hi, Carol McPhee, 20 South Pond. Um, Will and his cousin, my husband and Joni are, are her cousins. I'm obviously the in-law. Um, I just wanted to say that we're in favor of Linda and her dog. We live right next door. And I wanted to, sh uh, to show you, this is a picture of our grandson, Willie, who comes every Sunday. He and feeds Titus. He's two and a half. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get a chance to um, have it copied over for you. Um, he, we, we feel my daughter has no problem with, with um, Titus, and Willie loves Titus. He, he, again, like the other person with the letter said, can't wait to see Titus every week. He talks about Titus constantly. Feeds him little pieces of bread, and Titus is so careful and puts his teeth so carefully around his little fingers that I can't even tell you. Um, Willie has no fear at all of, of the dog. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, yeah. I used to be animal inspector. Yep. So I do know some of the laws a little bit. But one of the things I want to bring up, and I was aware and told about the instance of the two dog bites that Linda's dog supposedly incurred. Okay, first of all, the dog, she was in Newburyport, walking her dog in Newburyport. Her dog was on a leash and was attacked by a dog not on a leash, okay? Her dog got the best of the other dog, okay, and bit the other dog. Linda's dog was not at fault, okay? The dog unleashed in a town that requires a leash law was the dog at fault. I con contacted Michael Cahill about this said the same thing. I had informed Linda not to pay the vet bill. She was afraid and she paid the vet bill, which she had no reason to pay because her dog was innocent. Again, again the second incident of supposedly a vicious dog, Linda is walking her dog on a leash and her dog is attacked by a dog not on a leash. It doesn't matter what, now she's in a non-leash law area, but when you describe a <coughs> dog attacking the one causing the aggressive behavior. Okay, again, Linda's dog has not been aggressive. So I think the biggest thing here is to get rid of that aggressive behavior, aggressive dog, because it is not an aggressive dog. Hmm. I mean, how you can say that the dog got out and determine it's aggressive because it got outside, the dog has not made any attempts to get aggressive. Other dogs have came and made that attempt. Now, they refer to, I think Sue Beck referred to the 140, um, 
chapter 140 to section 157, where if you read it, no dog can be deemed dangerous just be by barking and growling. You cannot call a dog dangerous um, based on the breed of the dog or if he's reacting to another animal. Just because that dog barks at another dog walking by or somebody walking by, it is not considered an aggressive dog. So ideally, that should be taken right off the paper. Okay? The other thing, and this is all state laws and state regulations, a nuisance dog. All dogs bark. My dog barks at every single dog going by. And I live on Hay Street, and if you walk your dog on a portion of Hay Street, there's at least 10 houses that dogs will bark from. That is not nuisance barking. Nuisance barking is when it occurs continuously, okay? And the definition is excessive barking, and there's no definition of excessive, excessive barking in the state laws. So it's up to everybody to decide, okay? But excessive barking is disturbing a sick person or disturbing people from sleeping um, or threatening the people, and this dog has not done anything. So ideally, you have a normal dog behind a fenced-in area that might bark when people walk by, and ideally, this claim should be dropped because it is basically what we have, and I just feel is this is a nuisance reaction because a dog is barking, and I have been told by people, because I've heard this before, is when people start complaining about a barking dog, the minute the dog opens his mouth once, well, I'm going to call the dog officer and I'm going to put a complaint in just because the dog barked once when it walked down the street. And ideally, it's not a nuisance dog. I think what we have is a nuisance complaint. And I think it should be dropped. <laughs> Deep breath. Um, my name is Catherine Ardry, and I live on Green Street on the corner of Green and Hanover. Three years ago, just over three years ago, I was attacked in my own backyard July 4th weekend by a pit bull that came through a five-foot fence, unaggravated by us. N we weren't doing anything but being in our yard on July 4th weekend, having a barbecue with house guests. And the dog came over the pool in the neighbor's yard, jumped over their pool, headbutted the five-foot firm fence, and came at me and went right into my left leg. If it had not had been for Bosco, my fearless, lovable English pointer, who is basically a gomer pile, who came running back and bit the pit bull on the back, I probably would not be standing here and would not have walked here. I broke my left hand beating the pit bull off of Bosco. It took the four men who were in the house behind us who were renovating it, who owned the pit bull, they jumped, the, came around. I don't even really know what happened. They came. It took four of us to get the pit bull off of Bosco. My leg was sh shooting blood. I ended up going to the hospital in ambulance with uh, one of our dinner guests. My daughter and my husband ended up taking Bosco to the animal hospital, and he looked a bit like Frankenstein. He had staples around his entire head. I had been to the police the Monday before this accident happened, and I said, I am scared of this dog. It comes every weekend, and it visits. And they informed me that nothing could be done because there was no leash law in Newberry. Now, that's a whole different issue. But I recognize that this dog was aggressive, where it also is a family dog with small children in that house. And that's a scary thought. But this dog fritzed out for whatever reason, and I almost lost my leg, and I almost lost my Bosco. And I do not mean to demean any of your post-traumatic stress syndrome, but I had almost three years of therapy so that I could start walking again. And I came over because I didn't realize until I read in the paper that the dog that I am so afraid of in our neighborhood now is this South Pond dog. And I used to walk Bosco, and the dog, excuse me, I don't know, excuse, excuse me, the pit, the, the dog, I, I, excuse me, allow me to speak. She's, she's got the mic. Okay, allow me to speak. This, the dog on South Pond behind this 
chain link fence on several occasions came at me when I would try and be walking. And I gotta tell you, I fall apart. I hear a dog bark now when I'm trying to walk and, and it, is, it is an awful lot for me to get through and breathe through that. But that dog came at me with Bosco several different occasions it, behind the fence thrashing at it and I guess the reason I am bringing all of this up is because it only takes one mistake and if and, and you want to change the fencing and maybe uh, block the dog's line and say well that's a good thought but there is nothing in the world that is going to keep that dog in if he truly wants to jump over that fence and I don't want to get into a match with anybody and argue I am relaying to you a horrific experience that I had. And because there was no leash on, nothing was ever done. Excuse me. I don't see right. how you can say Alberta. that that was her dog. That was not her dog. Because how can you say it was her dog when your dog has never been charged for a dog bite? I didn't accuse him of biting. You didn't listen. He, he jumped over a fence? Oh. No, I'm saying... No, this was another dog. This was another dog. This was another dog. Her dog is not a great... Her dog, and also, you're laboring her, her dog a pit bull. Excuse me. And it is I, not a pit bull. I have been a dog owner for 10 lists of dogs that bite. Doesn't mean I, why should I put my dog behind a closure when my dog wouldn't, I know it doesn't bite yet. It's not an aggressive But I think, Albert, I think what's, what's going on, and I think generally I, I watched this young lady take a deep breath when she walked up. It wasn't easy for her to speak. And it's another, it's a, it's, it's a different, you know, it's a different presentation that we're having this evening. And she has altered some of her behaviors for the, just like, if I get another dog, I'm not going to let my dog run in my fields, which I did for years, without me being in my fields because of the coyotes. So I've changed my behavior, and I can see where she's a lot more careful, and I appreciate you, you speaking. Well, I so I think, I think you've got to, you know, yeah, oh, I think you've got to take and, and, un and understand. This dog and this dog. It wasn't easy for her either. And I, and I think what you're trying to say is you can't always say that that would occur. So that's, we've got to, you know, labeling right. labeling a dog. Right. Okay. Right. All right, all right. Sue, microphone. <laughs> Hi, Susan Becker, 22 South Pond Street. Um, apparently, I've been held responsible for this letter, but I was approached by several um, neighbors to try to get this together because of the barking. But secondary to that, um, I witnessed this 12-year-old um, basset hound that lived up on 13 South Pond Street, owned by Rick Betts. And he's belly dragging on the ground. He was just, he wasn't aggressive. And Miss Hanscom was walking the dog up the street with her on a leash. And Stan Dixon, who's a retired fire chief, had to kick the dog in the head. And she was flailing on the ground, trying to hold onto the leash while the dog had this poor basset hound in its, in its mouth. Okay, regardless of who's responsible for the vet bill, I don't know, people were traumatized. Second incident was this past Christmas when it attacked a little small dog on Kingsford Street. Mr. Crocker will witness how vicious that was. And on August 19th, the dog got out from the tree person, charged into my yard and stood up onto my window box and scratched my screen and went back and forth with my dog. And I was terrified. As I yelled at her, she chased it, couldn't contain it. It ran all the way down Withington Street. I'm not saying it's vicious towards other people but it has shown viciousness towards other animals, and I don't want to be the next victim. But it's her dog. 
Okay. Oh. I have the floor, ma'am. I have the floor. Okay. So I, w I was terrified. So all of a sudden there was an emergency order. Carol LaRock was good enough to come over. And as Carol will attest, I am probably one of the biggest dog lovers there is. And she has been better with the barking on the dog, as I say. But as this woman attested over here, you're going to have an incident. And I guarantee it, it's going to, it's another one that's going to happen. So I'm just, if you don't deem them dangerous, that's, that's my, that's what I have to say. All right. Anyone? Yes, sir. My name is uh, Charles Carker. I'm at the Green Cell Pond. And I did witness. Could, yeah, last... could you go a little bit just so that the TV can pick it up? Just get a little closer. I witnessed uh, the dog fight uh, Christmas Day this past Christmas. And Ms. Hanscom did have her dog on the leash. She was walking by. The other dog was loose. It used to live at one Kingsford. It no longer does. It approached and they went at it. It was a dog fight. My issue is control. She was on the ground being dragged like a rag doll from this 130 pound dog that she owns. She's a frail woman. Control. No control whatsoever. She was strewn around the street until we went out and pulled the dogs apart. And, and that's my major concern with, her, with the dog. It's controlling it. It's difficult to control an animal that big. A big guy would have a problem with this dog. When he's going to go, he's going to go. She's a frail woman. And she was dragged along the street. She couldn't even. She wasn't even on her feet through this whole dog fight. It would end it in a few minutes. The dogs were pulled apart. Yes, her dog was on a leash. Yes, she was walking it. The other dog approached, and they went at it. But all I could see was her being strewn along the street, and I'm concerned about all the children we have in that area. I'm concerned about safety for everybody in general. Yep. Saying kill the dog or what, whatever their issue is, but more restraint for the animal. Somehow, some way, we'd like to see that, we'd like to see that happen. Okay. All right? Thank you. Any, yes. Linda. Yep. Linda Hanscom. Yeah. It's all right. Okay. Um, and um, it states, the, the petition says he's a pit bull mix. He's not. He, that I know of. And that's been straightened out. And um, Charlie just said he's 130 pounds. He is not. I just had him weighed yesterday. Someone mentioned he was 130 pounds. He's 91. Yeah. Uh, 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 well, he, she had him weight. How much did he weigh? 91. 91. Okay. Big dog, though. Yeah, he is big. Okay. He is big. I'll give you that. For most everybody, oh, it's not working right? No, you're good. I'll just make sure okay. it's full off. Um, most everybody thinks, thinks uh, yeah, big, yeah. Most everybody who doesn't have a dog thinks big dogs are dangerous. And he's not, he's not that dangerous. I mean, I've got, I know he hasn't, I know the facts about viciously attacking the neighbor's dog. Um, the, down the street, there wasn't even a fight. And he didn't drag me. He didn't drag me at all. No, you didn't. Charlie, you wouldn't even let me talk. You came up by with your kids and hollered at me and said, you can't control him. You can't control him. You can't control him. And you wouldn't let me say anything. And no, you didn't. Uh, I, wait, wait. She's, if, if you want to rebut. No, no, but if you want to rebut, you come up rebut afterwards. You can rebut it afterwards if you want, but Thank I you. know there was not a fight. Zeus came over to my dog. My dog pounced on Zeus, and I threw myself up, because I know Titus grabs the other dog and don't let go. I threw my weight on the dog, on him, because I'm heavier than he is, and I um, tried to get him to let go, and it didn't work. That's why when Brett came out, I was sitting. I, he didn't knock me down. I would tell the truth about that. Because I, if he had, if he has in the past, yes, he has knocked me down on occasions. And I would be honest about that. And some people don't think I am being honest about it, but I am. Because I think God values honesty a lot. And there's no way a person can have a relationship with God unless they're honest. I would not li tell a lie like that. I wouldn't. Right. Linda, uh, would you 
explain, uh, like the dog collar that you got. Explain to us about the citronella. Yeah, yeah. Dog I, collar. Linda came in to show me a couple days after the incident. She had gone down to Petco and she bought um, a collar uh, that. And how does it work? Yeah, they, they you put it around it, and the the vocal cords of the dog when he barks, it sprays the citronella at their nose. You put it right there on the dog, and it sprays, and, and it's supposed to get their attention away from um, any bark. Every time they bark, it squirts at them. Yeah. So Linda got that to help with the, the barking. And um, Linda, I'm reading in this letter that when you're walking the dog, are you using a muzzle too? I was from August 19th to I think it was September 6th. Then, I, then the restriction was taken off. OK. So I didn't now have the you are Let me ask you, what's, what's coming through to me? and I don't know about the other members or the folks in the audience, is I'm kind of getting a message that he's probably decent with adults and kids, it seems, when they don't have dogs with him. And he seems to not, not have a problem. He seems to be kind and, and easy to be with. But if there's a, another dog, the issue changes. And that's the way very often with a myriad of dogs. Dogs, a lot of times, don't love other dogs especially when they're with their owner, and right. especially when another dog runs up to their owner. Was the muzzle effective when you were walking the dog? Would it have worked if there was a kind of a fight? I mean, I imagine muzzles would stop him from grabbing the other dog, right? Yeah. When you walked Titus was with the muzzle, did it make, I mean, I'm not being odd or anything, but it did it make Titus that unhappy? Yes, it did. Yeah, he was very that, uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he kept trying to rub it, rub it on things and get it off. Yeah. So, right. Chuck, do you have any questions for Linda? No, I've heard enough. You've heard enough. Now, yeah. before we go forward a little, yep. and it's not easy, is Carol still here? I mean, Carol. It, it then. All right. I just like to recognize Carol in it. Carol being a person that has come up against a tremendous amount of these issues, not asking you what we should do, because I wouldn't put you on the line. <laughs> she wouldn't tell you. But <laughs> <laughs> do you have any observations about what has worked in situations like this, like walking with a muzzle or going other places to walk than a consolidated neighborhood if there's that many real issues with fighting with other dogs? Or, or Does anyone else have any comments? Yes, yes ma'am, come up. I live at 25 Worthington Street, and I live right behind Linder. I have three kids, one 9, 14, and 21, and my 9-year-old goes over almost every Sunday and Friday and picks up eggs and plays with Titus, and never once does he even think about even biting him. He runs around the yard with him. I have no fear of this dog. I don't think that some people might not like this dog, but he's just not as bad as people in this neighborhood are putting him out to be. Mm -hmm. you know, what, what about you. barking, where you live so close? Is I have two dogs myself, and they play together. Okay. And they play, and I don't, I live, my window is like right in front of her yard, and I, he barks, but it's a normal dog. Dogs bark. Yep. And dogs are allowed to bark. Yep. You know, if someone in this neighborhood don't like dogs, I mean, I was out in my yard the other day, and a dog walked by, and the dog was barking at Titus to no return. 
So I walked up, and it was a little dog. Linda was sitting in the chair, and Titus was sitting down, and the dog was just barking, barking, barking. Okay. And the lady got mad at Linda yep. and yelling at Linda. Because her dog was outside barking. Yes, the dog was viciously barking as she walked by. Okay. And, and, and Titus didn't, he barked, but of course he's going to bark if another dog is barking. And it, did you say Titus plays with your dogs? Yeah, they play back to back in the yard. My dog jumps over the fence, a little thing, and runs around with the chickens. <laughs> really? I mean, they just all play together. And it's not that he's that vicious, <laughs> which I don't think he should. And I don't think it's very nice to put a muzzle on the dog because there's dogs in the neighborhoods that I mean that walk around and let them do, you know, it's something is just for this dog that I don't know what it is. Okay. And I don't think it's right. Thank you. Thanks. John McPhee, 20 South Pond Street, Newbury. I just want to say that when Linda was working, I was in her yard, in her house, taking care of Titus at least once a week, with Linda not even there. And I found him to be the friendliest dog. And I, the first time I went in, I hadn't even really met him. She'd only had him a, f a few weeks, and I hadn't even really met him. But I walked into the yard, I opened the front door, I walked in. He's a mush. <laughs> and I mean, I love that dog. So I have no okay. fear. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. I'm an outsider. Okay. I'm from Newburyport, Marjorie Killam. I was there in the incident on South Pond Street. Wally was not on a leash. I don't recall seeing Sue Becker there. She claims she was. If somebody approached you and your hand tied, and somebody tries to kick you, are you not going to try to respond? That's exactly what Titus did. Titus did not start that problem. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> anyone else? All right. Uh, comments from us? Did someone know? Chuck? Joe? One more. Yeah, I've got oh, a one more. Excuse oh, me. I'm sorry. Right. I'm Dorothy Safrowich. I'm, I live diagonally across from Linda. And I've been there for eight years. The dog constantly runs up and down and barks. He barks at nothing. He barks at car. He barks at other dogs. He barks at runners. And it's a constant thing. He goes out in the morning. Linda used to let him out like one minute after seven on a Saturday and a Sunday, and the dog would start barking. Once you're awakened by the dog, you're not going to go back to sleep. It's just this constant thing. She's doing better with the dog. But I'll tell you, it's not. People are all saying they live, they don't live close enough to listen to the dog all the time. Right, you're related to her. Mm -hmm. All right, wait, wait, wait. She's got the I microphone. The, okay, you can rebut afterwards. Okay. You know, I mean, they all know it. The, the dog is a nuisance. It's, she has no control over it when she's walking it. She can't, it's always pulling. It's a dog that is like wild. Because if some other dog comes up to it, it can go and it'll, it'll hurt the dog. She should have, if she's got a 91 pound dog, she should have to have control over the dog and, and have it sit, have it come to her, have it listen to her. They shouldn't be like walking around a big dog who has bitten other dogs in the neighborhood. He told, ripped Wally's face off. The dog is tw was 12 years old and could barely walk. So uh, it's just these people, a lot of them that are talking, don't live close by. They don't hear it all the time like the neighbors do. Okay. Thank you. Ma'am. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Matak. My husband, Francis, and I live directly across from Linda. 
We have two children, five years old and 10 years old. The five-year-old just recently stopped taking naps, so we are well aware of the issues with Titus. Uh, he does bark, he does bark. We are right across the street, we know it. But Linda has made just incredible efforts to settle him down, and he is now much less of a barker than he was. Uh, she has tried really hard to go be a good neighbor, and we recognize that. We organized one of the letters that you have there. We had every single person who surrounds Linda, who directly abuts Linda's property, sign it. People have different opinions about the dog. Some people like him, some people don't. But one thing we all agree on is that Linda has taken a lot of effort to quiet him down, and she has worked really hard. And we support the dog staying with Linda. We don't support Linda being harassed by people. and. Uh, you know, we, we live right across, so we do have some viewpoint on this. Okay, thank you. I'm a runner. My wife and I walk by Linda's house every day. Every day we go for a walk. The dog does bark, but once I go over to the fence, I can talk to the dog. I have never seen a dog take an aggressive posture. Never. Never shows his teeth. Never, you know, look in your face angry. Never. Very quiet. In fact, he ignores me. I mean, I speak to him. He don't even look at me. <laughs> now, you talk about aggressive dogs. I mean, my wife used to ride her bike with me when I ran in West Newbury. And I've been back right up to a fence before with an aggressive dog. And how did we handle that? I put this little can of halt on the back of my wife's bike. And we started getting attacked by a dog, which we have several times. We were, we were really attacked. She takes out that halt, sprays the dog in the face, and that's it. It's over. The dog just you know, squints like that, doesn't hurt the dog. It just interrupts their train of thought. And as far as uh, Titus is concerned, he barks because he's letting everybody know where his territory is. That's all. Somebody goes up the street, he wants to let them know that's his territory. Don't come over. But if you did, he wouldn't do anything anyway. <laughs> and he's out there walking with the chickens all the time. I can't, I can't get over it. <laughs> so that's my Thank that's you, my Rod. Story. Thank you. All right. Joan, <laughs> one more time. <laughs> Sorry. No, we need the microphone. Yeah. I don't appreciate having my relationship to Linda as being her cousin used to tarnish what I've said. Uh, Linda knows and I know that if we ever had a problem with each other in the 60 odd years we've lived side by side, then the other one would know it. And if I had a problem with Linda's dog, she would know it. If she had a problem with me, I, I would know it. So my opinions are based on fact and my true opinion, not my relationship. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Can she speak from here? Pardon? Can she speak from here or does she have to go up? We, um, no, she's, no. We need the micro, is, is that, Caleb, is that a wireless microphone? Yeah. Okay. I just want to say that I have a 15 pound dog and he likes Titus and Titus likes him and there's no trouble. And he weighs 15 pounds. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> One more? Uh, you, we you gotta know, have. The ear of the halt, spray, is something maybe Linda should be carrying because the dogs are coming to her dog, even if she's yeah. in a leash, ear, yeah, where it's a leash dog is in effect, maybe if Linda had the halt, that she could protect her dog from being bitten also. Yep. Okay. Uh, all right. I think uh, we've kind of. Has anyone got anything new and different? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, motion. Uh, oh, comment and motion. Yeah. Comment. Uh, oh wait. We got we, Mike's got one more thing. Go right ahead, Chief. Uh, I apologize. I think the board has to decide two things: uh, whether the dog's a dangerous dog, and whether the dog's a nuisance dog. Um, so you, I think you'll have to vote on both issues, and. Can you describe party, what will happen with either vote for me, please? If the dog is deemed a dangerous dog, the Board of Selectmen um, 
have the right to have Miss Hanscom um, restrain the dog in any manner to have it deemed not dangerous. Okay. If the dog's deemed a nuisance dog, the Board of Selectmen have the right to order Miss Hanscom to take remedial action to, um, if it's nuisance dog for excessive barking, then to to alleviate the barking if the board finds that. If either party, um, people in favor of the board voting dangerous and nuisance or um, people against are aggrieved by the board's decision, they do have the right to appeal to the district court within a certain amount of time. Um, a hearing would be held at the district court and the, the um, decision of the district court would be deemed final. And uh, that's all I have to say. Do you know what the time period is for that? I Okay, there's a few dogs that I know that when they are in a car and you put your hand in that car, wow, you're in serious, serious trouble. You let that dog out of the car, pat him, friendly, tail wagging, everything's fine. I'm wondering if Titus is one of those when he's on a leash, he's in protective mode really concerns me here. The muzzle's absolutely the way to go with that, whether the dog likes it or not. Um, I'm really trepidatious to put a dog down for anything or to deem him dangerous. I'm wondering if there's any way we could put him like on probation for a certain amount of time. If anything comes up again, bam, we'll bring the level of the law down on well, I mean, she has gone strides here. Look at the things she's done. Six different things here to try and stop this. And, and if, you, if you go up and look at her yard, like you've driven by, yeah. right? Um, the chain link fence, uh, especially with the, she changed the gate so it can't yeah. be opened inadvertently. And that yeah. appears to me to be a good restraint. Now, the, yeah, the question am. comes when she's walking her dog on a leash yep. and another dog that's not on a leash approaches it. Well. <laughs> I agree, but That's I still... That's what the incidents have been about. Yes, and as I say, the attacking the other dogs, that really concerns me. Um, the muzzle will minute, cure that. Minute. Didn't the other dogs attack him? He was on a leash. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's kind of the unfair advantage, though. <laughs> I mean, look at the weight of the dog um, and the, the weight of the person walking. Yeah, okay. Her. okay, it's a very, very serious issue here. Yeah. Okay, and uh, I'm afraid the muzzle is going to have to be the way to go. You know, okay. if the dog is out in public. So, okay. in my, that's my opinion. Yep, okay. Now, is there a way we could do the probationary period? Uh, is that something, Chief, any ideas on this? I would have no idea. How it's never been done before. Not to my knowledge. Hmm. I think that from the stuff I've heard, things are on the improve since she yep. got the back collar. I might okay. point exactly. So, that's, that's one point. Um, Another one is, uh, you know, and again, Linda's changed the fence around so someone can't inadvertently leave it open, mm -hmm. okay? So uh, that part of thing, uh, we've, we've never heard anything. As far as the dog's aggression to other dogs. May, may I be heard? Yeah. The law says, chapter 140, section 157, um, no dog shall be deemed dangerous, one, solely based upon growling or barking, or solely growling and barking, two, based upon the breed of the dog, or three, if the dog was reacting to another animal or to a person and the dog's reaction was not grossly disproportionate to any of the following circumstances, protecting itself, protecting its uh, owner, um, the other dog was threatening and teasing, engaged in teasing, tormenting, battering, assaulting, injuring, or otherwise provoking the dog. Um, Basically, that's it. So the law, the law is very specific as to what you can and can't deem dangerous. I will leave this up here for you to review. Um, yeah. It's right here. Thank you. So you can read that. I, I've read that with the day we did the to, um Jeff, comments. I mean, this is more on the abstract. It's more of a notation and thought for you, Chuck, in a way. I've always been a Labrador guy. <laughs> and the la yeah, I wouldn't have figured, right? And the Labradors are considered usually to be probably the most non-aggressive dogs in most circumstances. I have to say I've only had one lab, and I've had a lot of labs since college, 
that wouldn't protect himself if another dog was in the process of biting him or attacking him or trying to get near me. So, I mean, dogs do protect themselves. And it's a little hard now, and it, and it gets complicated because especially where the pit bull and the idea that it's not a pit bull and everyone's afraid of pit bulls, so, I mean, it gets, it gets hard because, as, as the chief said, the breed, it says nonspecific to breed or something. And what, what, but the, now the thing for me is there's been a lot of evidence here tonight. And I certainly don't want to see anyone get hurt or, or a dog get hurt in, a, in its con condensed neighborhood. Uh, the muzzle makes some sense to me, but I still have some thinking that I will be making as we continue to talk on the muzzle. Um, but seriously, if a dog's on a leash and another dog comes after it like Chuck is talking about and there is a dog fight, most likely there's going to be a dog fight. So that was probably didn't. If there's a dog fight, there's going to be a dog fight. There's going to be a dog fight. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> but I mean, if, <laughs> what I mean by that is you either keep the other dog away from Titus when he's walking in the yard, I mean in the neighborhood. Read B. Or, you know, because he's, he's associating with other dogs and not I having like complications. That. Meaning, you know, so it's just not it one all. dog. Yep. I don't agree that it's a nuisance dog. Okay. After, to, after being in the house with it. Okay, that's the thing. All I right. went, up, went in the house with the yard with it. So, Say it loud, Joey, so everyone can hear. Okay. Uh, we talked about the, the nuisance, the definition here about being a nuisance dog. And I don't agree that it's a nuisance dog after going into Linda's house with a dog. If the dog's ever gonna be very protective, it's gonna be in their house like you talked about. Your dog would protect you. And believe me, the dog, I had dog hair all over me by the time we were through with the visit, okay? He kept rubbing my leg, rubbing my leg, and licking me, okay? And uh, he lives with chickens, okay? So, um, now Peter Murphy isn't here tonight, and he called me about this, and he lives directly adjacent behind Linda's. They have a common fence. And his dog plays with Linda's dog, and I don't know what kind it is, but it's like a shoebox, okay? <laughs> and he, he said no, and he says some of those other, he said that dog doesn't bark any more than some of the other dogs in the neighborhood. And that was his opinion of it, so anyway. And, and he's as close as it gets, so. He couldn't be here tonight, and that was his comment. Matter of fact, his wife wrote one of these letters in favor of Titus. So, anyway. Wow. All right, so we have, we have two things we want to address. All right? Yeah, nuisance or dangerous. Oh, Is what? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Or dismiss. Well, but both of them, either far or dismiss. Okay, you want to take the, make a motion on the nuisance one first? Well, you want to do the dangerous one first? No, the, the nuisance does. I'll make a, a motion that um, the, we dismiss the um, the thought that he is an, a nuisance dog. Okay. Second the motion. Second. Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Okay. So be on the record that it's voted that he's not a nuisance dog. Is that um, I'm the tiebreaker, so it's two to, yeah, all right, I'll vote with it as unanimous, okay? I don't, my vote the is. Tiebreaker, how did you vote? Yes. Made the motion, yes. He made the motion. Yes, you did. Second. You made the motion and not vote for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Concede the point? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, now as far as being a dangerous dog. Yeah, make a motion that he's not a dangerous dog. I'll second that motion because of what the chief said and, and what I'm reading here, but you know, certainly a dog needs to protect itself. So on that, I'll make that motion, I'll second it. Okay, any okay. other, do you want to comment back on it? You agree, well you made the motion, so um, you agree with the motion? Shall we put a time on that? Um, you, you know what I would like to do is, it sounds like there's been some pretty good efforts made to Mm -hmm. Curtail Curtis's uh, enthusiasm. 
Titus. Titus. Curtis Whatever. Titus. <laughs> Curtis is, Kurt, Curtis is the fireman. Curtis is the fireman. And, and, he, and he's being very calm lately, okay? He's so, behind the fence, right? He's behind the fence. No, he's outside the fence. He's doing okay. But what I would like to see is these efforts that Linda's making continuing, and I'd, li I'd really like the neighborhood to get together with co some constructive work up there. And um, Chief, Chief Riley and I talked extensively about the barrier fence and um, like I, I've ridden by a couple dozen times since then. Sometimes he, I don't think he recognizes me, okay, on my car. You know, maybe he's smarter than I give him credit, okay. But uh, sometimes he like goes along the fence. Sometimes he looks at you like, what are you doing? You know, and other times he ignores you, okay. But I really think, I, I agree with the chief that if we could get a group together to try and get some of that screening in the chain link fence so he doesn't see what's going outside. And maybe we could do this a community thing or, and help Linda with it, you know? You know, because, you know, Curtis, no, Curtis is part of the neighborhood too. He lives over there. But, <laughs> but Titus is part of this neighborhood, okay? And um, I think we all need to work and make him feel welcome. And if there's something that someone doesn't like, speak up and try and work together on it. That's what I'd like to say. And the thing, the thing that has merited the thinking tonight is the fact that there has been definitely two sides to this issue and I mean as constructive <laughs> meaningful people as selectmen sitting here we've heard from both sides and there is a lot of evidence to the fact that Titus got the ruling from us because he deserved it <laughs> from listening to you folks so thank you for coming tonight we, no. need, we need to vote on the dangerous thing. Okay, I thought we did. We didn't? No, the, okay. the motion was made, seconded, and all in favor of um, dismissing the dangerous charge, I guess. Is that how you want to root it? Yep. Okay, and all in favor of dismissing the dangerous charge? Yes. Aye. 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 And myself, unanimous. <laughs> so, anyway, like I say, and if anyone in the neighborhood sees something that we need to tweak and make better for the whole neighborhood, let's try and work with that. Okay? Thank you. Um, we did the liquor license. Dawn Java. Dawn, thank you. Thank you, Dawn. Nice to meet you. Kathleen Pearson. Well, wait a minute. What? She's not coming. No. Yeah. Why don't we give it a couple minutes? Yep. That went well. Believe me, Chuck. That, that went well? Look at it. <laughs>
<laughs> they don't care. Linda, Linda you got to take everyone outside. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Sorry All for right. the delay, we gentlemen. That was quite a hearing. <laughs> wow. Bar oh, come on. I wanted to bring All it right. home. We have Barry Fogel <laughs> and Rod Italian here, and they're going to give a briefing on the 21E cleanup at the Farmer Circle finishing site on Route 1. And Rod did not come for the dog hearing, but he got caught up in it. So. <laughs> I think that's how I got him to come here. <laughs> Again, I'm Barry Fogel. I'm with the law firm of Keegan Worlin, and uh, I've been working with Rod and Circle Finishing for a number of years now. As everyone will remember, or perhaps not, but uh, 20 years ago there was a fire at his industri industrial building. Years. Wow. 93 <clears throat> at the Circle, um, south near the train station on Route 1. And in putting out the fire, the uh, the uh, water washed into the wetland and took some of the contaminants uh, from the materials that were in use into the wetland. Um, the building was raised um, and the property's been inactive since then, but uh, Rod intermittently has had the resources to do some of the studies required under Chapter 21E, and now he has been able to wrangle the resources to actually implement a cleanup. Um, he has Arcadis. Uh, an environmental group has designed the remedy and submitted that to DEP. You, you got a letter that's on your correspondence, a part of the agenda, just giving you standard notice of that filing. Um, what it will require and involve is about two-thirds of an acre of wetland remediation, uh, which means to the east of the property, into the wetland, um, the about a foot or so of the root mat and, and silt and sediment still holds some of the metals and other contaminants. And so uh, in order to remediate that, it needs to be coffer dammed off. So the proposal is to put a coffer dam in, a temporary coffer dam on the east side of the property, um, control the flow of water in, let that dewater, and then probably in the late winter, um, when there's no wetland species growth, um, actually excavate out the top foot of that material down to about the, an inch or two um, of the clay that underlies that wetland. Um, and then put back a suitable wetland sediment um, and replant it with cattails in the growing season in the spring when the job is implemented and have a restored wetland. The coffer dam will come out, water will flow back through. Um, so that's the main part of it. Um, the upland part of the site, historically, even before that, was a gas station. And so near the dispenser islands and where there had been historical storage tanks, there were some petroleum releases. So there are about four areas in the upland that will be excavated as well um, as part of the same project. Approximately 200 to 400 cubic yards of four total out of four isolated excavations. That material will be hauled off, properly disposed of as well. Um, and then the site will be uh, ready for a future use. Um, there had been over the years a number of people have shown interest in the property but were concerned about not taking ownership until the remediation was done. Um, and there had even been some discussion with uh, the town about a rezoning that might fit what's going on at the circle. We'll have to revisit that when the time comes. So. In order to do the work in the wetlands, it needs various permits. Uh, one is from the Conservation Commission. A notice of intent was filed with the Conservation Commission. There's a hearing set for that next week. Um, a water quality certification from DEP is required uh, because there's more than 5,000 square feet of wetlands being altered. The Army Corps of Engineers, through its programmatic general permit, has a Category 2 screening. Their, their standards need to be met. Uh, but the primary review is with the Conservation Commission, and they're going to get a full look at this. The mm -hmm. Notice of Intent describes in detail the work. Um, it's relatively straightforward. It's just it's in a wetland. And so uh, the main thing is to make sure that the coffer dam is installed. T. Ford, the company in Georgetown, is the engineering and construction company that's going to do the work. Um, and they're working with a company called Portadam, 
uh, and they have a temporary coffer dam design that can be put in. They float out with flat bottom boats. They install the coffer dam. Dewatering occurs um, through frack tanks that uh, properly um, treat the water before it's discharged back out. And then you have a <coughs> dry, so to speak, wetland. But with timber mats and other proper materials, the material, the excavators can get out, the trucks can get out and haul the material away. So um, real progress. I mean, you know, Rod's um, taking out a line of credit on his private residence in order to make this happen, but he sees light in the tunnel in terms of being able to use those funds to get this remedy implemented. Um, one of the big things that made it possible is that DEP, and some of you may have been involved in this over the years, have relented on wanting full repayment for what they spent on the site and have agreed to release their lien uh, upon payment of a certain amount that's being negotiated, but something that's affordable and would make it possible to be repaid when the property is suitable for sale and, and sold and developed. So they, they made a move that helps, and so that kind of uh, facilitated getting everything going. Yeah, as, as Rod says, without that it really wouldn't work. Um, now that, that may just be the DEP sort of realizing that you know in a situation like this, nothing was gonna happen without them being reasonable about it and, and so we're glad that they've seen the light on that. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure you were, you know, other than just getting the letter, I contacted Tracy and said if you wanted a briefing and she said, sure, come on in. So um, we hope you'll keep your eye on what's going on. Um, if you're interested, uh, attend the Conservation Commission meetings. Uh, uh, won't be as exciting as tonight's meeting was, but uh, <laughs> it's interesting. Um, any questions I can answer, or if you, thing go, things go along, if you have questions, you know, let me know through Tracy. And I we'll think this is real good because the people that follow our meetings and follow reports on it, when something starts to happen over there, oh. they're going to have an idea what it's about. I think it's a very good idea. Well, and you're going to get contacted because it's yep. been dormant oh, yeah. so long. You know, they, hey, what's going on? Yep. So hopefully if we can get the permitting done this fall and winter, it, it'll take place um, late winter of 2014, so yep. first quarter of next year. All right. Great. Yeah. All good news. That's Any good. plans for the property other than just <laughs> sell it? Yeah, you want to buy it? <laughs> <laughs> now, I, there's different levels of cleanups, right? Is this going to, what, what level are we going to make this? Well, in the wetland, it's, there's no, there's um, no, there's no choice. Okay. Yeah. Right. It's got to be remediated so that it doesn't present a risk to okay. environmental receptors, you know, the animals and the plants in the wetland. On the upland, the excavation is going to be thorough in terms of, there's not going to be any contaminated okay. soils right. left. Yep. And then the groundwater monitoring will follow because when you remove the mass of contamination, it's not a lot, but whatever it is, it continues a little bit to affect groundwater. Groundwater tends to improve rapidly after you've done an excavation yeah. like this. So it should be available for all use. It's commercial. It's yep. unlikely to be residential anyway. Um, and it's not zoned for it. So. No. no. And, and some of the neighbors, neighboring property owners have sort of you know, ogled the property over time, and we expect they'll come back, and others may. I mean, you, yeah. you know, I'm aware, and Rod's aware that that area is targeted for growth and part of what both. Well, right the across the street, this yeah. Yeah. project. Certainly and the city of Newburyport is interested. They they get copied on what's yeah. going on. It's not occurring in Newburyport, but they're the, the wetland and the other property. The, their concom's gotten notice. So now you're in the know, and uh, we'll let you know Harry, when things when start. They take in, uh, you know, dredge or uh, take away the contaminated uh, material in the wetlands, do they have to rep replicate that wetlands again? Yeah. Yeah, th there's a, you know, they... Yeah, it's a fair amount of work, bro. That's, wow. yeah, yeah. Well, you bring, you bring in um, a certain oh, yeah. Yeah. thickness and volume of a suitable wetland sediment. I mean, obviously, as water then ref filters back through that over time, it's yep. going to bring in natural sediments, yep. but it's a natural loam or silt that will support the uh, cat We had tails. a business out on Hanover Street, went through basically the same thing, and I watched that whole process, and it was pretty involved, I got to admit. Yeah. Oh, it's so. interesting stuff, yeah. And he's got a great team. He's got a, you know, a licensed site professional who's been on the site for a long time at Arcadis, and they're an expert group. T. Ford knows exactly what they're doing, and Mary Rimmer is a local wetland Good, yeah. scientist who is well known in all the yeah. local communities and yeah. does a great job. So, 
All right. Thank you. Good, Thank good you. luck. Right. Thank, Thank you for you. setting hey, through finally, that. Finally, finally, <laughs> right. Yeah, no Thank question. You. It was interesting. See you later. The wetlands just the way it is now. It's like, yeah. Yeah. It, everything imaginable is living in there. And so we haven't ever seen anything with gold snake come up with them. <laughs> or anything like that. that yeah. So it isn't that bad right now, but it's just the fact it tests that we, bad. we know. It, yeah. it, it tests bad. And we made an effort with DEP to try to do an alternative risk assessment and to do some data crunching. And, um, you know, they're within their regulatory rights. They're being conservative about it. Mm -hmm. um, they look at it, I think, that given, the, rather than um, insisting on the lien being repaid, they realized that if they were to let up on that, the money could be used for the remediation. So I think they stayed conservative on the cleanup and got a little bit relaxed on the repayment of the lien, which, frankly, I think makes the better sense. Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're, yeah. lu you're lucky with that soil there. You're only having to dig out a couple inches of it versus yeah. five feet down. I mean, yeah. right. the clay. When, one time the blue clay came in handy, you know? You know there's 80 feet of clay there? Yeah. Oh. Truly. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, when, when we first bought the property. Mm -hmm. And we had to get down 90 feet to hit, uh, yep. to hit the bedrock. Uh, it's yeah. marine clay, which obviously, when the during the glaciation, yeah. the ocean came up that time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Amazing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right, we have new business license. Sheila Basson, DBA, the barn at 286 High Road. She's not here. What? She's not here. Um, all right. So we'll ask her to come next time. Yep. Put it up. Yeah. All right. Um, Decision on Veteran Service District. Okay, we've got to do that next time. Okay. Yep. Five one day liquor license of protection, fire number two, 927, 1012, 1018, 1016, and 12 1, all from 7 to 11 p.m. Paperwork motion. all right, Kathy? All right, motion? Motion to approve. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. The minutes of the August 20th meeting, those are what you sent us, Kathy? Yes. The any, any, uh, they look fine to me. Motion Chuck, to approve. Second. Okay, no corrections? No. All in favor? Aye. Okay, Aye. we got the letter from Arcadis US. Yep. And um, that's it. Warrants. Oh, we got warrants to sign. Oh. All right, we'll sign the warrants. Um, we can adjourn and sign them, right? Mm -hmm. All right, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. To bring Aye.